So today I want to do the, set up the expression for the scattering amplitude for scattering off the spherical symmetric potential, and then compute the cross section, and then prove the optical theorem, and then I want to go back to the first Born approximation for the special case of a Yukawa potential, and the limit of the Yukawa potential, which is the Coulomb potential, is the mass of the Yukawa particle goes to zero. So let me get back to where we basically, I'll review some of the last things that we did to get some formulas on the board. Something we were calling the free partial wave of momentum, well, wave number, let's say, K, LM, and R is the square root of 2K squared over time. The spherical Kessel function JL of KR, and then the YLM of theta and B. And remember the JLs are pretty simple functions, namely JL rho is minus 1 over the L, rho to the L, 1 over rho, dB rho to the L, of sine rho over rho. So these are relatively simple expressions, and remember in this partial wave analysis, it's very often the first partial wave, L equals zero, that's dominant, or maybe the second partial wave. So what we're dealing with here are pretty simple functions. The behavior of JL of rho as rho goes to zero is something like rho to the L over 2L plus 1 double factorial. On the other hand, JL of rho as rho goes to infinity is minus square root of 2K squared over pi. Well, let me write something simpler than that. In fact, let me use the top part of the board. In other words, JL of rho as rho goes to infinity is approximately 1 over rho sine of rho minus L pi over 2. And so if the exam, we're going to be interested, of course, in using phi zero at large distances, and so we can say that this goes to, as rho goes to infinity, this goes to minus square root of 2K squared over pi, YLM of theta and B, and then E to the minus I KR plus IL pi over 2 minus E to the I KR minus IL pi over 2, and all of that divided by 2I KR. Remember, in all this, rho is equal to KR. And the reason why we wrote it in this funny form is that we want to identify, this is an incoming wave, we're going to relate this to the incoming plane wave, and this is the outgoing scattered wave. Any questions? Remember, I have to talk quickly. There's a famous expansion for E to the I KZ, and it's equal to the sum L equals zero to infinity, I to the L square root of 4 pi 2L plus 1 
at long distances, this equation becomes uh, d2 dr squared plus k squared on ukl of r is zero. So that's the asymptotic behavior. And so u is a, a linear combination of um, is, uh, say, a e to the minus i k r plus b e to the i k r. And um, then one can argue that a and b have to be of the same magnitude. And the reason for that is that um, uh, that this incoming wave, all of it goes out. We're talking about uh, scattering without any absorption. And um, so this thing can be written as some constant times the sine of kr minus some beta sub l. And what is beta sub l? Well, it's it's whatever the thing is, so that when 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 this thing when we get near the origin, we get back to this boundary condition. And so, in other words, you solve this equation, you apply this boundary condition, um, and uh, the asymptotic condition that a equals b, and then you wind up with. Uh, something proportional to the sine of the kr minus beta l at large distances. At small distances, you have something that's more like sine of kr. And um, uh, then you rewrite beta l somewhat so that you write it as c sine kr minus l pi over 2 plus delta l. And this delta l is a big deal in potential scattering. The reason why you do that is you want to pull out this fact, this uh, uh, phase, because this is the phase that occurs in the spherical vessel function at large distances. And so it is what occurs in, um, in other words, if with no scattering, delta L would be zero. And you just have a um, plane wave would come in and just keep going and there would be no scattering at all if delta, all delta L's was zero. OK, then at large distances, uh, this thing, in other words, EVI KZ at large distances just looks like this. And you have this as the case of L part of it. OK, so, so that's um, basically a review. And this thing is called the phase shift. I guess the reason it's called that is that this is the phase of the plane wave. When you shift, you get a plane wave plus a scattered wave in a sum like this. OK, well, um, what, if, if this is our u, what is our phi? So phi KLM of R then as R goes to infinity. Um, and some c sine of kr minus l pi over 2 plus delta l <coughs> over r ylm of theta and d. And now we're going to write it the way we wrote, um, where is it? This one. We're going to write it like this. And we're going to say it's uh, minus c y l m theta and phi, and then e to the minus i k r, e to the i l pi over 2 minus delta l minus e to the i k r, e to the minus i l pi over 2 minus. L and this is all divided by 2i r. Okay, let me get rid of some of the um,
Okay, so that's our expression. And but what we want to do is we want to match this up to be a plane wave in the z direction plus a scattered wave. And so we um, multiply each of these partial waves. Uh, we multiply each of these partial waves by a phase factor, an overall phase factor. And um, so that means we call that phi tilde KLM of R, and it has the asymptotic behavior as R goes to infinity of minus YLM of theta and T and now e to the minus i k r e to the i l pi over 2 minus e to the i k r e to the minus i l pi over 2 and then e to the 2i delta l. In other words, we multiply each of these guys by e to the i delta l to get rid of this factor. And so we close this bracket and then we divide by 2i to k r. Okay, so so whereas the um, the plane wave looks like this and at infinity uh, looks like that, uh, the, the partial wave looks like that. Over here, the partial wave looks like exactly the same thing except the factor e to the 2i delta l. All right, so remember the way we've written our, our, um, our, uh, our notation is that the full scattered wave, the full wave function is the incoming wave function plus e to the i k r over r f to k of the principal theta and phi, although for very much potential there's no phi dependence. And we're going to write this as as a sum in terms of the constants here phi tilde k l zero and zero because there's no uh, we don't want any uh, phi dependence in here. And in fact, we don't, we don't need any for the EVIKZ either. And um, so in fact, we're going to write this as a sum L equals zero to infinity I to the L square root of four pi 2L plus 1, phi tilde KL0 of R. So in other words, it's, it's the same expansion as over here, um, except that, and that is uh, the same expansion as that, except that the, um, I'm looking for the, of the expression phi zero here that the phi zero is replaced by phi tilde, which means that we um, we multiplied by the e to the i delta l, and um, we have a delta l in it because it has a scattered uh, phase. All right, so I personally I think that. So what we do now is we just continue here, and this is a sum, i to the l, this is a sum i to the l, square root of 4 pi, 2l plus 1. Um, well, I'm put a minus sign in front of it. Y L zero of theta. And now that whole thing is being multiplied by one over T I K R and this structure here, which is um, 
e to the minus i k r. Frankly, one can write this as i to the l. I don't know why we don't do that. I guess I can call it minus i to the l. Two pi i delta. Two, I mean, not no pi, wow. Two pi delta l. Okay. Now what you can see is that this chunk here, together with all of that, just gives you the e to the i k z. And so this part is going to be the scattered wave. And well, it's, no, it's a little more tricky than that. What we want to do is we want to take some of this and put it in there also. So let me just note this simple identity. E to the 2 i delta l can be written as 1 plus 2 i e to the i delta l sine delta l. And you can check that by saying, well, this is 1 plus e to the i delta l. Now, sine delta l times 2 pi i is e to the i delta l minus e to the minus i delta l. And so when you multiply through, this times that gives minus 1, which cancels this. This times this gives e to the 2 i delta l. So that's the correct identity. So now we're going to substitute that in there. So when we substitute this in here, this thing becomes minus the sum L equals 0 to infinity I to the L squared to the 4 pi 2L plus 1 YL 0 of theta and then times E to the minus I KR E to the I pi L over 2 minus e to the i kr e to the minus i pi l over 2 over 2 i kr. So that's what comes out from writing e to the 2 i delta l as 1 plus this. The 1 term picks out this. And then the other term means that e to the i kr over r 1 over k e to the minus i l pi over 2 e to the i delta l sine delta l. Okay, so this first term here, this times that, is just e to the i k z. And the rest, by definition, is f k of theta e to the i k r over r and so the scattering amplitude f k of theta then is this stuff, which is to say the minus signs cancel is a 1 over k. You pull off the, you factor out the EBI kr over r, and the 1 over k sum on l from 0 to infinity square root of 4 pi 2l plus 1 e to the i delta l sine delta l and then a y l zero. Okay. So that's the final expression for the scattering amplitude for a spherical symmetric potential. Okay, now we can do two things. We can calculate, first of all, the absolute value squared of that is the differential scattering cross-section. If you integrate that over 4 pi star radians, we get the total cross section. 
Another thing I should say is that not only have we been considering um, potential scattering for spiritual potential, but we've always been assuming that there are no bound states, there's no absorption, there, there's no particle production, and consequently the momentum going out, the wave number going out, is the same as the wave number going in. That is to say, the, kin this is the kinetic energy of the particle going out is the same as the kinetic energy going in, and that's called elastic scattering. So this is, so this is the elastic scattering number. And as I said, the, the, pro, the differential scattering cross section, d sigma d omega, is just fk of theta squared. All right, now what is the total cross section? Well, the total cross section is the integral of this uh, over d omega. And so the total cross section is the integral uh, d omega and of this whole structure here. So that's 1 over k squared. Um, and it's going to be a sum of L and L prime. The 4 pi's come in the square root of 2L plus 1, 2L prime plus 1, uh, e to the i delta L minus i delta L prime uh, sine delta L sine delta L prime and then y L zero of cosine theta y, well, oh, just theta. When you do y, you know, so, so that's a theta and y L prime zero of theta. Well, these guys are orthogonal and normalized on the unit sphere, so that just sets you that just sets L equal to L prime, and um, so as a result, then so the total cross section. is, after you do this integral, you have 4 pi over k squared, sum simply on L, 2L plus 1 from here, the uh, phases cancel, and you get sine squared delta L. So that is the actual formula for the total cross-section and potential scattering. So you see, if these phase factors are zero, there's no scattering at all. OK. So any questions? You can also see that the, the maximum value of any of these delta L's is, um, is, is uh, of sine squared delta L is when delta L is pi over 2. And um, in that case, sine squared delta L is 1. And if they were all pi over 2, then what you have it would be a completely divergent sum. It would be infinity squared, essentially. Um, right, now let's notice something that's kind of amusing. Let's multiply. Scattering, let's look at the scattering amplitude. Let's look at the scattering amplitude in the forward direction and multiply it by 4 pi over k and see what we get. Well, first of all, I need to start with the imaginary plot of the forward scattering amplitude. So that's f uh, where k is equal to 0. This then is 1 over k sum square root of 4 pi, 2L plus 1, sine, oh, the imaginary part. The imaginary part of EPI, first of all, this guy is real. The imaginary part of EPI delta L 
is simply sine delta L. So this is sine squared delta L. And um, YL0, as I said, it's real. It's that thing we wrote down earlier. What I should have done was, in other words, remember that this YL0 of theta is equal to um, square root of 2L plus 1 over 4 pi PL of cosine theta. And these were not polynomials of real. So when you take the imaginary part of this thing, the only part that is involved is this, the only complex part. So we get that, and then we get a square root of 2L plus 1 over 4 pi, and then PL for theta equals 0. Well, that turns out to be 1. The genre polynomial P, uh, P0 of theta is, is the number 1. P1 of theta is cosine theta. Cosine theta is 1 when theta equals 0. Now, that doesn't prove it for all L, but um, it's true. Uh, and so what we get there for the fourth of the sum is 1 over K, a sum, 2L plus 1, sine squared delta L. And so now you see that the total cross-section is equal to 4 pi over K times the imaginary part of the forward scattering amplitude. And this is called the optical shift. Now, um, it's, as I said, it's called the optical theorem. And in fact, it's, it's worth noticing and remembering. It's worth, in fact, even being, it's, it's worth a lot of respect, this theorem. Because it's not simply true in potential scattering or spherically symmetric um, potentials. In fact, in quantum field theory, you can prove that the total cross-section, including everything, production, inelastic, elastic, everything, the total cross-section is the imaginary part, the spoke by a the imaginary part of the forward elastic scattering amplitude. So let me just make right here, elastic. So the generalization, and that's, and, and we, we were doing this in the context of non-relativistic quantum mechanics, when I say in the context of quantum field theory, that's the context of relativistic quantum field theory. And there, the total cross section, 4 pi over k, measuring part of the forward elastic scattering amplitude. And um, so that's, uh, that's important. Notice something else, and uh, I might come back to this um, next Monday. Uh, but remember that um, one, one has, um, remember the phrase dispersion relation. So if you imagine that this elastic scattering amplitude is um, an analytic function of K, say, then um, you can think about writing the dispersion relation for the elastic scattering amplitude. And remember, one of the things that happens is that you wind up expressing the scattering amplitude as an integral of its imaginary part. Well, that turns out to be the total cross-section. And so, um, basically, this optical theorem played a big role in uh, dispersion relations. This was, this was done a lot in the I guess the 50s, the 60s, and 50s and the 60s. Um, and then it gave rise to a, um, a whole industry called uh, analytic S matrix theory. Where S just stood for scattering. And people tried to um, say that in fact, uh, do away with 
on the field theory, you would use things like dispersion relations. That would go where? I'm exaggerating. It wasn't quite that bad. It did give rise, ultimately, to string theory, which, again, may also be leading nowhere. By the way, before I erase this, it's worth looking at this. This, if I trust the blackboard, is cytosine. And it's not the whole cytosine, because the cytosine is linked to a sugar phosphate background, and the guanine is also linked to a sugar phosphate background. And so there should be a sugar here somewhere, and a phosphate group, and another phosphate group, and another sugar, and another sugar, and then another thing that's either guanine, cytosine, or adenine, and or, what is it, thymine? Oh, yeah. It's either uracil or what T stands for. Tyrosine? Anyway, actually, I'm not sure you can change this, you guys know. What you have here is this is an oxygen, and this here is, what you have here is a hydrogen, and what, and the electron can come off the hydrogen, and anyway, and be attracted to the oxygen, and so it sort of sits in between, and when it sits in between, this is essentially negatively charged, this is positively charged, and they're attracted to each other. And that's, there's also a hydrogen bond here, and this is called a hydrogen bond also. And you see there are three atoms that can participate in hydrogen bonds here, and three that can participate here, and so that, also, this, notice here that guanine has two rings, and cytosine has one, and remember that this thing is then attached to a sugar, and then two phosphates, and then again a sugar, and another phosphate, and this goes up to the next one. So the, this is the sugar, this is DNA, this is the sugar phosphate, these are two sugar phosphate backgrounds, backbones, and there's only a certain distance here, so you can accommodate two rings and one ring, but not four rings, you can't have two rings here and two rings there, because then things would be in each other's faces, or if you had one ring here and one ring there, they'd be too far apart. And so the, so what you have then is, you have to have two one, in other words, if you have a one ring here, you need a two ring over there, and then it turns out that the, the only one ring here that will bond, that has the arrangement that matches one is cytosine, and so that, that's the basis of the genetic code, that you have A bonds with T, and G bonds with C, and so that's how DNA works. Any questions before I raise it? Any questions? Thank you. 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 Thank you.
So it turns out that the error rate, it's just remarkable that these molecular machines have an error rate that's, unfortunately, I don't remember what it is. I haven't looked at it lately, but it's down below 1 part 10 to the 6th. It may even be 1 in 10 to the 9th. But at any rate, it's, do you remember what it is? Anybody remember? Actually, if you're online, you could Google DNA polymerase error rate of antigens. All right, let's, where are my notes? I guess I have them down there. Anyway, it's just absolutely amazing that this error rate can be so low. All right, well, let's get back to, let's get back to the Born approximation just as an example of how you compute certain things here. And let me write the scattering amplitude then. So this is the first Born approximation to the scattering amplitude. And here, I'm going to use a slightly different notation. K is the incident beam, and K prime is the final, is the final beam that is to say goes in the direction of the observer at a distant point R. And this is equal to minus 2 mu over 4 pi H bar squared. Now the integral of DQ times prime, E to the I, K minus K prime dot X. Why am I using X prime? Let's get rid of the primes. Okay, so remember it's the Fourier transform of the potential. And if you keep track of what the normalization factor is, that's what it actually is. And, well, we can choose, as usual, choose K minus K prime to be the Z axis for your polar coordinate system. And in that case, you can write this as minus mu over 2 pi H bar squared integral D phi integral D cosine theta from minus 1 to 1, 0 to pi integral 0 to infinity R squared DR E to the I K minus K prime cosine theta R. And let's assume that this is a spherically symmetric potential, so we have a D of R there. And let me write Q as the absolute value of the, this thing is called the momentum transfer, K minus K prime. In other words, the original momentum is K, the final momentum is K prime, so the difference between the two is a momentum transfer. Okay, so the first thing is we do the D cosine integral, and, well, we do the D phi integral, and then that's minus mu over H bar squared. And now doing the phi integral, that leaves us with the R integral. And this gives us E to the I Q R minus E to the minus I Q R. And we have then I Q R in the denominator, and then D of R. And so altogether then this is minus 2 mu over H bar squared Q integral 0 to infinity D R R D of R sine Q R. So that's the expression. The book can't continue because we don't know what V is, but that's the expression. And, again, the scattering cross-section, differential scattering cross-section 
2 k squared minus 2 k dot k prime. And so this is equal to 2 k squared times 1 minus cosine theta. So that's what q squared is. So d sigma d omega in the first form approximation with your power potential is the absolute value squared of this, and that gives us 2 mu g0 over h bar squared m squared 1 over m squared plus q squared squared. And that's equal to 2 mu v0 over h bar squared m squared 1 over m squared plus, and now q squared is, well, it's a trigonometric identity so that you can write it either the way I wrote it, which is 1 plus 2 k squared times 1 minus cosine theta squared, or you can write it as 2 mu v0 over h bar squared m squared 1 over m squared plus 4 k squared sine squared theta over 2. This is one of those half-angle formulas that are kind of mysterious. Okay, what does this look like at high energies? Well, at high energies, obviously it goes as 1 over k to the 4 at high energies because all of this goes away. And you can say, well, it's a v0 squared, there's a mu squared, there's an h bar to the 4, and an m squared, but the important thing is that it goes down as k to the 4. Now, also, you can see here that in the forward direction, the sine squared of theta over 2 is going to be 0, when theta is equal to 0. So in the forward direction, this k to the 4th behavior goes away. So in other words, although the cross-section in an arbitrary direction goes down as 1 over k to the 4th, in exactly the forward direction, it doesn't go down. So there's a forward peak that's pronounced at high energies. And it's pronounced because the scattering is usually suppressed as 1 over k to the 4th in all other directions except the forward direction. On the other hand, at low momenta, low incident momenta, then the k squared term is essentially 0, and the scattering is isotropic, and it's just S-wave scattering. In fact, that's something that we learned before, way back here. You can see that if k minus k prime is very small, then you don't expect to get much angular dependence. But the way, when we were analyzing our partial waves, what we said was, let's see, where was it? It was way, way back over here. JL goes as rho to the L, and consequently, it takes a while for the spherical, for the partial wave to build up. And so the, so at very low energies, what you're going to get is the L equals 0 wave, because the L equals 0 wave is already big at the origin, but the L equals 1 wave goes up as, goes up linearly. The L equals 2 wave goes up quadratically. So, 
So at low energies, you're going to have isotropic scattering. Okay, now we can take the limit, the other limit, namely the limit M going to zero, and let's see. I'm a little concerned, though, because of the factor M here. Oh, yeah. What we're going to do is we're going to take the limit. We're going to do something a little bit. I don't know if you know. Oh, yeah. Let's look at what our potential was. Our potential looked like this. Okay? It had a V0 over an M. So we can take the limit. M goes to zero, but V0 over M goes to a constant value. And what happens in that limit? Well, in that limit, T sigma T omega goes to 2 mu V coulomb, we can call it, over H bar squared squared times 1 over 16 K to the 4 sine to the 4 theta over 2. Here, V coulomb is Z, Z prime, E squared. And so T sigma T omega goes to 2 mu squared Z, Z prime, E squared squared over H bar to the 4. And then this factor, 1 over 16 K to the 4 sine to the 4 theta over 2. And then the final version is, I don't know, I don't see the point of writing that. It's exactly the same as, well, if we put it in terms of P, the H bar to the 4 and the K to the 4 becomes P to the 4. So let me just use the eraser to indicate that. And this is a rough point. Okay. Another way of writing this, so let's write it one more time, is 1 over 16 Z, Z prime E squared over the kinetic energy of the incident particle squared 1 over sine to the 4 of theta over 2. And so once again, it's peaked in the forward direction. And the peaking this time occurs because this M, the blunt peaking at low energies, isn't there. So it's just always peaked in the forward direction. If you go to pi over 2, then you've got sine squared of pi over 4, which is sort of like 1 over root 2. If you go to pi, then you have maximum suppression because you have just this whole thing becomes 1. Because pi over 2 is just 1. The sine of pi over 2 is 1. Okay, so this is the classical form of Coulomb scattering. So you see, although we had some worries about the Coulomb potential, it basically worked out. Are there any questions? Remember, I do have a chalk. All right, so let's look at this again from a... Let's look at this first form of approximation again. So we've seen the first form of approximation as a function of Q, the momentum transfer, 
is minus 2 mu over h bar squared q integral 0 to infinity dr r v of r sine q r. So that's the expression, and we can draw some conclusions, some properties from this. One, well, d sigma d omega is a function only of q, and q is that, and q squared is 2k squared times 1 minus cosine theta. So that's, this is for a spherically symmetric potential. Spherically. Two, this potential is real, so f1 of q star is equal to f1 of q. So the scattering amplitude is real, and that tells us then that the first Horn approximation doesn't have, although it's a, it tells us it's a reasonable approximation in many cases, especially when the coupling is weak. It tells us that it, it would tell us that the total cross-section would be zero. In other words, you don't have enough information in the first Horn approximation to compute the total cross-section, even approximately, because the imaginary part of the Ford scattering amplitude should be the total cross-section. d sigma d omega is independent of the sign of v of r. So that means that whether you have an attractive potential or a repulsive potential, the first Horn approximation gives you the same scattering cross-section. And so you can imagine scattering an electron off a nucleus or an electron off another electron, you're going to get, apart from the mass differences, you're going to get the same cross-section to lowest order, which is somewhat puzzling. So you get to a higher order. So k prime, of course, is length of k times r hat, just the vector in the direction of theta phi. And so q is small when k is small. So in other words, the low energies, obviously, from this expression, q is small. And so for low energies, q is small. And so for low energies, f1 of q is approximately minus 2 mu over h bar squared q. And in fact, you can bring this q in here, and you can say sine qr over q should just be an integral 0 to infinity dr r squared v of r. Right. And equivalently, if you toss in a 4 pi, you can multiply that by 4, so then you have minus mu over 2 pi h bar squared. I'm sorry, I should have taken the q in there. Integral dq dx v of dq r v of r. In other words, it's the volume integral of the potential times the volume integral of the potential times the volume integral of the potential. 
time, which is a constant, times minus mu over 2 pi h bar squared. So in other words, as at low energies, the first Born approximation um, becomes independent, becomes an S wave, and not only is it an S wave, but it's a constant independent of, uh, of momentum as the momentum gets small. So that was four. And now uh, number five is um, at the opposite direction when Q is much, much greater than one over uh, M or one over the range of the potential. In other words, if you have Q going to infinity here, then um, what happens is this uh, you, you get that the sign of QR oscillates like crazy over the region. In other words, it looks like this. Suppose the potential looks like this. The range of potential is this distance, say, R. And then you're, you're multiplying V times QR. Well, as Q goes to infinity, the thing looks like that. And uh, the... the uh, and, and the, 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 so F1 of Q goes to zero as Q goes to infinity. Um, I should have a better way of saying that, but I don't. Anyway, in, it's small as, as Q, as, as Q, uh, as Q, uh, gets bigger than Actually, it's not Q greater than 1 over M, it's Q greater than M. Because M is 1 over the range of the potential. Okay, now, um, I've been discussing all of these in the case of spherical symmetry, but in fact, the last three properties are, uh, are true for the first born approximation, even in the absence of spherical symmetries. Spherical symmetry. So that it's independent of the sign of R is just because the, the, the differential cross-section is in the first Born approximation is the absolute value squared Fourier transform of the potential because it's the absolute value squared it's obviously independent of the sign of V. Moreover, um, if um, it's the Fourier, again, it's a Fourier transform of the potential as K and K prime go to zero, uh, that Fourier transform is just basically a volume integral of the potential. And so it goes to a constant, whether or not the potential is isotropic. And um, finally, if the potential has finite range, and you set Q to infinity, you're taking the Fourier transform to something of finite range, and um, it just goes to zero as Q goes to infinity. And so those occur whether or not it's um, isotropic. But the first two properties uh, are consequences of it being a um, and, uh, a, uh, a surface metric potential. Okay. Um, what um, what? else here. Um, I guess there are a couple of more topics. Um, one topic is this Lippmann-Schwinger formalism. Now it's it's a do you want to see the Lippmann-Schwinger formalism? I guess we sort of run out of time today. So let me just show you what it is. It's, it's basically that you say that your scattering amplitude is a free a ket corresponding to a plane wave plus one over e minus uh, h zero plus or minus i epsilon times v times psi. That's basically the the equation, and um, 
I don't know. It's a lot. It's a lot of mathematics. I'm not sure how much physics is in this. So what do you think? Do you want to? You guys want to see that next time you do it? Do things that are more physical. More physics. All right. All right. Let's let's quit. I'll think about it. One thing that I would like to do is show you some connection between phase shift, scattering length, and bound state. See if we can get that done. See if we can work that in. All right. I guess we can end this thing. So click on.